Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Bringing Novel Biomarkers from Research to Clinical Use. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Our webinar today features faculty from the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and the webinar is sponsored by Sphingotech. Sphingotech is a biotechnology company based out of Henningsford, Germany. The company develops innovative biomarkers for prediction, diagnosis, and therapy monitoring of acute kidney injury, congestive heart failure, and septic shock. To learn more, visit Sphingotech.com. Mayo Clinic is a nonprofit organization committed to clinical practice, education, and research, providing expert, comprehensive care to everyone who needs healing. The Mayo Clinic Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology and its reference laboratory, Mayo Medical Laboratories, provide advanced laboratory testing and pathology services to support more than 4,000 healthcare organizations around the world. Revenue from this testing supports medical education and research at Mayo Clinic. Complemented by collaborations with diagnostic and biotechnology companies, the department maintains a robust diagnostic test development program, launching more than 100 new tests each year. To learn more, visit mayomedicallaboratories.com. So let's get started. You can post questions to the speakers during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them in the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I will now present today's speakers, Alan Jaffe, MD, Jeffrey Musen, PhD, and Leslie Donato, PhD, all from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Jaffe is a consultant and a chair of the Division of Clinical Core Laboratory Services. He holds a joint appointment in the Department of Cardiovascular Diseases. Dr. Jaffe is a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and also a professor of medicine. Dr. Musen is co-director of the Cardiovascular Laboratory Medicine. After graduate school, he spent three years as a postdoctoral research fellow supporting Mayo Medical Laboratory's esoteric test development. Dr. Musen research interests include lipid and lipoprotein testing. Dr. Donato is co-director of Cardiovascular Laboratory Medicine and co-director of the Hospital Clinical Laboratory and Point of Care Testing. She is a consultant in the Division of Laboratory Core Laboratory Services in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. Our presentation will now begin with Dr. Jaffe. The floor is all yours. Welcome to this seminar on the development of novel cardiovascular biomarkers. I'm the chair of the Division of Core Clinical Laboratory Services here at the Mayo Clinic. The cardiovascular lab is part of my division, and since I'm still a practicing cardiologist, I have a special affection for that lab. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm a consultant for Sphingotech, which is sponsoring this seminar. The Mayo Clinic is a storied medical institution started over 150 years ago by Charlie and Will Mayo. 
The clinic mantra today is the same as it always has been. The needs of the patient come first. As you may know, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester has been rated as the top hospital in the nation by U.S. News & World Reports. It is an integrated practice of 4,500-plus physicians, 3,800-plus residents and fellows, and over 58,000 employees. Our total budget for research and education is over $1 billion much of it provided by institutional funds. The Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology is one of the largest laboratory operations in the world and is dedicated to the development of novel tests that will help our mission of caring for patients both here at Mayo and around the globe through Mayo Medical Laboratories. What we would like to share with you today are some of the efforts we have made to develop new testing. We'll start first with Dr. Jeffrey Mewson, who is one of the directors of the CV Lab and who will discuss the development of some novel testing by mass spectroscopy for ceramides, which are sphingolipids that appear to aid in the detection of residual risk in patients with heart disease. Then his colleague and co-director, Dr. Leslie Donato, will discuss our developmental activities involving novel protein assays being developed in conjunction with Sphingotech. With that, we will start with Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Jaffe, and thank you all for having me a part of this today. So I was going to start with a test that has already gone through the process here at Mayo Clinic from just being an idea to being now clinically ordered and in use in our cardiology practice. So this test started, as many do, when researchers approached us with an idea. And what happened in this instance was a group of metabolomics experts came to us with some data that they had gathered using an untargeted lipid approach uh, using mass spectrometry. And what they did was analyze hundreds of different sphingolipids, and they used a well-characterized cohort of patients that both had an uh, instance of CV mortality and then carefully age, gender, and other uh, matched controls, and they identified out of that list that there were three ceramide species that all seem to be elevated very significantly amongst the cases. Since these three species were somewhat similar, we thought a more dedicated method uh, could be developed that would look into, uh, that had uh, potential to be of clinical use. So the three ceramide species identified in that untargeted study were ceramide 16, ceramide 18, and ceramide 24-1, all three of which were increased in cases with cardiovascular disease, and each was independently linked to poor outcomes. Additionally, a fourth ceramide species, 24-0, at the bottom of the screen, although not linked to any disease, did seem to add value as a normalizing factor <coughs> since it was the most abundant ceramide found in all patients. So at this point, we did a little more background research and wanted to look into just what ceramides are. And there's been quite a bit of basic science over the years found that ceramides are actually a complex lipid synthesized in all cells, and they're very biologically active. They're signal molecules, and they tend to accumulate, particularly in tissues not suited to lipid storage, in situations of caloric excess, hyperlipidemia, inflammation, or ischemia. All cells, as we said, contain the machinery to make ceramides, either de novo or rapidly by converting from sphingomyelin. Additionally, it's been shown in basic science research that atherosclerotic plaques are enriched with ceramides, that ceramides are carried through the circulation uh, associated with apolipoprotein B lipoproteins, that they increase the amount of LDL infiltration into the vascular wall, and that they promote aggregation of LDL lipoproteins once within the vascular intima. Additionally, ceramides are associated with inflammatory cytokines that are known to be involved in cardiovascular disease, as well as disruption of the nitric oxide signaling pathways and vascular dysfunction. 
So based on the preliminary data, it seemed like this would be a very promising biomarker. Additionally, the same group that had, had brought us forward the untargeted data was able to show that in a another case study using a specific measure of just these three uh, metabolites or these three specific ceramides, that they were highly predictive and that the adjusted hazard ratio uh, for each of them continued to be independently predictive of cardiovascular death even after adjusting for other biomarkers such as LDL cholesterol, ApoB, statin, age, smoking, et cetera. So at this point, we decided to begin the development of a multiple reaction monitoring LC mass spec assay. And the first um, challenge we encountered as we, as we went into this project is illustrated in the cartoon you see. The problem is, of the four analytes we want to measure, there is several orders of magnitude difference in their concentrations in most individuals' plasma. <clears throat> the reason this becomes somewhat of a struggle is because you need to balance the amount of response we get across those concentrations and make sure that we have enough signal that it's out of the noise and yet not so much signal that we're saturating our detector. And as you can see, the four different ceramides span quite a range. So we spent lots of time finding the perfect uh, LC conditions and uh, internal standard ratios, et cetera, to make sure that we had a decent signal to noise and linearity across all four species and uh, across the relevant ranges required in each. And what you can see here is in the final method, we were able to demonstrate linearity for all four species across the relevant ranges, as well as an LOQ or a limit of quantitation with an uh, imprecision of less than 10% for all four. Going on, we would do uh, as we would with any other assay that we want to make clinically available. We ass assessed the precision or imprecision and found that we could, with the conditions we had created, measure ceramides, all four ceramides, in plasma samples with a precision of less than 10%. We then went on to identify the stability so that we could know how long samples could be treated in various conditions as well as the ideal storage and transport conditions to get specimens to the laboratory. And you can see that here. It turns out we can uh, allow ceramides to uh, be stored eight hours ambient, 24 hours refrigerate, or 30 days frozen. We went on to then assess a normal value study, which we did by recruiting and vigorously uh, vetting inclusion criteria to make sure we had a normal, healthy population of whom we measured, <clears throat> in whom we measured the ceramides of the different varieties. We found that it was not a normal distribution amongst our healthy population, but rather a log normal distribution. And again, it fits that different orders of magnitude as we've been struggling with through. In the end, we had a plasma ceramide test available by mass spec using uh, plasma, EDTA plasma, and then with these stability conditions. So while we were going through the analytic validation to ensure that we could offer a clinically robust method, other groups were continuing to assess the clinical utility of this test in various well-characterized cohorts. One of those was the atheroremo study in which patients undergoing angiography had very uh, sophisticated imaging of intravascular ultrasound as well as uh, near-infrared spectroscopy of their coronary arteries. And when patients' results were compared with their ceramide measures, it was found that Again, ceramides were increased amongst patients that had more lesions and worse lesions, those that had more necrotic plaque or a higher lipid core burden. And following these patients for one year found that the ceramides were again associated with outcomes. Another study published in the European Heart Journal and a different group of patients found again that the ceramides were highly linked to outcomes despite being adjusted for typical um, covariates uh, considered in cardiovascular disease, and that the normalization of ceramides to that fourth ceramide was, uh, caused an increase in the predictive utility. <clears throat> As part of our own validation, 
not only did we do an analytical characterization of the testing, but we evaluated the utility of ceramides using the method we had developed in a patient cohort that we had uh, recruited at Mayo Clinic. And what we did was recruit about 500 patients that had undergone an elective coronary angiography for a variety of reasons, and we excluded those patients that would be at the highest risk, such as those with diabetes or an organ transplant or with known renal fa failure or a prior coronary artery intervention. We found the same values as what had been previously shown in the other studies. Ceramides were highly predictive of having a subsequent event, and that if you normalize the ceramides to the ceramide 24-0, it increased the predictive utility. At this point, we were wanting to make a clinical test available, but since we had three values plus three normalized values, we thought it might be a little bit confusing to put this into clinical practice. And working again with the group that we'd initially uh, approached us about this, we developed a score. And that score is fairly simple in that you give zero, one, or two points based on the percentile that the value was in of those six different measures. So you can have a full scale of zero to 12 points. And then if we go back to the cohorts that we uh, measured, we found that the score actually was not influenced by triglycerides or any other cl uh, cholesterol measure, which was good. That shows something of independent information and that incidence of events increased as the score increased. With this, we then decided to give the red, yellow, green uh, reporting scale that uh, clinicians often use when interacting with their patients and discussing test results, and we labeled scores in various categories as either low, moderate, increased, or high risk. Looking at the angiography patients seen at Mayo Clinic and tested for their ceramide, plasma ceramide concentrations, you can see that event-free survival is significantly altered depending on what the individual's baseline ceramide risk score was, and that this holds true regardless of their baseline LDL concentration. Those individuals on the left had an LDL cholesterol less than 100 mg per deciliter, and still the score was able to identify those at highest risk of developing cardiovascular event. The score is also very synergistic with CRP, which is a commonly used inflammatory biomarker of cardiovascular risk. And you can see here that the incidence of events, regardless of if your CRP was high or low, is still increases uh, with the increased score. The score has also been applied in two other cohorts and tested in European populations. Each cohort had over 1,500 patients, and again, as the ceramide risk score increases, so did incidence of cardiovascular death. Finally, in a primary prevention study, the score was shown to again be predictive of cardiovascular outcomes, and <clears throat> this shows that the utility is uh, broad beyond um, just secondary prevention and also includes the healthy uh, primary prevention populations. Additionally, some studies, very small studies at this point, have looked at the ability to modify ceramide concentrations. In a small group of 24 healthy normal subjects given simvastatin for two weeks, they found a significant decrease in ceramides. The same was seen amongst uh, men with metabolic syndrome taking resuvastatin for five weeks. Another study has looked at uh, the effect of aerobic exercise training and found that there's a significant decrease in plasma ceramide concentrations following a few weeks of a 12-week program of one hour a day of aerobic exercise. And then finally, and this is most recent, and this was a study performed by a group not affiliated with Mayo Clinic or any of our previous collaborators, and they looked at a subset of the PREDIMED trial, which was an interventional trial where patients were put on either the Mediterranean diet or um, a control diet, and what they found was those individuals given the Mediterranean diet fared better, and those individuals that had a ceramide, increased ceramide risk score given the, the Mediterranean diet 
uh, actually had outcomes similar to those individuals that would have had a low risk score to begin with. So this suggests that a dietary intervention is highly effective and that the ceramides are able to identify those individuals that are able to benefit from the intervention. So in conclusion, we were able to take the concept of a test looking at uh, that was first thought up from untargeted lipidomics and bring it to a clinical, um, clinically orderable and currently used test at the Mayo Clinic practice. And with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Donato to talk about some more tests that are in the pipeline. Thank you, Dr. Musin, for that uh, presentation. So. Um, Jeff has now given you a very nice example um, of an, an in-depth example of a, taking a test from the basic science into the clinical, clinical orderable realm. Um, and that test required quite a lot of development in our laboratory for, at, for assay development since it was a mass spectrometry assay measuring multiple analytes that uh, we needed to optimize parameters in our own laboratory to be able to um, offer it and then do the analytic um, and clinical validations of those assays. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some other novel biomarkers that are in our pipeline that aren't um, as well down the pipeline as, as um, Jeff just talked about. And these two, I'll be talking specifically about two biomarkers. Um, and um, this is in collaboration, as has been mentioned before, with um, our collaborators at Sphingotech. The two biomarkers uh, that we'll be talking about today are proenkephalin and proneurotensin. So let's get started with these. So we'll first talk about enkephalins. Um, enkephalins are endogenous opioids. They're mainly released by heart and kidney tissue, um, and the receptors for enkephalins are highly expressed in the kidney, as you can see in uh, the diagram here. It turns out, however, that enkephalins um, themselves are very unstable peptides. Um, and in this graph, you can see that that's the blue peptides shown in the diagram here. Uh, and so as a surrogate, um, because, because these enkephalins are very unstable, it's very hard to measure them in the laboratory. As a surrogate marker, our uh, collaborators at uh, Swingotech have developed an assay to a different peptide called proenkephalin. So proenkephalin is, um, or P-E-N-K, um, is, uh, is the parent protein, but if measuring an internal peptide here called P-E-N-K from 119 to 159 in the amino acids, you can see that um, we're targeting a specific peptide within proenkephalin that's much more stable and can be assayed. And are, it is produced in equal molar concentration to enkephalins, but doesn't suffer from the, um, the problem of instability. So they have developed a, um, an immunoassay-based platform um, that will specifically target this peptide, this internal peptide, to the proenkephalin protein, the parent protein, um, that is easily measured in the laboratory. So why would we want to measure uh, proenkephalin? Well, it turns out that um, uh, proenkephalin is inversely, the concentration is inversely correlated with um, glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, so renal function, as you can see here, with increasing PNK um, quartiles, uh, you can see a decreasing in EGFR on the y-axis. And several studies have been done looking at proenkephalin concentrations in different models of uh, varying renal um, uh, function. In this particular study, was intriguing to us in the practice, uh, in the laboratory, as well as our, our physicians in practice, because it looked at uh, patients undergoing coronary artery bypass or cabbage surgery, and looking at those individuals who went on to develop um, acute kidney injury. And as you can see from this uh, diagram here, from this data, 
uh, serum creatinine values increase after about, significantly increase after about, um, uh, in the hours post-surgery, uh, about two days, whereas um, proenkephalin concentrations increase much earlier in the course of those uh, patients, those 20 individuals within this cohort that went on to develop acute kidney injury post-operation. And so that is attractive, obviously, for um, identifying these patients earlier on in their clinical course to then hopefully intercede uh, to try to prevent that acute kidney injury from occurring or mitigate the, uh, the, the downstream effects. So this data, along with many other published uh, studies uh, using proenkephalin in uh, renal, different renal models, prompted us in the laboratory to look at this biomarker more closely. So um, the question is, you may be asking yourself, okay, you, you have a new, a new novel biomarker. Um, what's, what's next? What, what does the laboratory do next in, in their evaluation if they're really interested in, in evaluating it? Well, what you have to do uh, for any, any biomarker like this is look closely at the literature at what assays uh, assay or assays, if there are multiple, that are being used. Because as a laboratorian, we'll need to decide which assay, if there are multiple assays, uh, would you like to uh, develop or, or, or um, dedicate your time to evaluating. In this case, of course, we, we partnered with uh, Sphingotech, the company who developed the assay for proenkephalin. And then obviously you have to decide whether your laboratory has the means, uh, the resources to devote to evaluating these, uh, this novel biomarker. So you first uh, have to figure out the clinical need and interest in your practice population, of course, your, your um, physician population. And then internally in your laboratory, look at your resources. So equipment, uh, this could be equipment, this could be personnel, this could be financial, this could be um, uh, certainly study samples as well, uh, patient samples that you'll need to use uh, when you're doing both the analytical and clinical validations. So all of these are, are things that the laboratory should um, think about when trying to evaluate whether a biomarker uh, should be evaluated in-house. If, if all signs point to yes, then uh, the laboratory and the laboratory director can then uh, move on to the next phases of evaluation, and those, of course, are both the analytic and the clinical evaluation of that biomarker. So, for the analytical evaluation, here's the chance to evaluate all, all of the assay performance um, specs of the assay under, under examination. So in the design, and, and um, Dr. Musen outlined this very nicely in his presentation, the design will always include um, similar parameters for any biomarker under evaluation. These are always precision of the assay at different concentration ranges throughout the analytical measuring range. You want to um, evaluate the accuracy of the assay, um, the measuring, d define the measuring range of that assay, uh, define the reference intervals in a healthy population or, or a reference population, whatever it is you use for that. Um, evaluate analytical specificity, so what could potentially interfere with the numbers, the, the values that you get in the assay, et cetera. So there's many parameters that will be included in all assays, but there are also some assay-specific parameters that you'd want to look at depending on the methodology. So in here, in, in, uh, the, for the case of um, proenkephalin, this is an immunoassay. An immunoassay obviously has antibodies that will bind to the target peptide or target protein um, of interest. So things that might, you might want to look at for um, evaluation here are um, interferences by heterophile antibodies, potentially if the antibody interaction uses a biotin streptavidin um, um, mediated um, interaction, then uh, potentially biotin, exogenous biotin might interfere, and that you may have heard about this recently in, in the new FDA warning um, that came out for patients who are taking uh, uh, either over-the-counter or prescription biotin supplements uh, that does interfere with some amino assays out there. Um, 
And then, uh, so that, that's for the case of immunoassays. So you really have to know what assay it is that you're doing, the chemistry behind it, to understand some of the analytic evaluations that you, you will need to perform. In the case that Dr. Musen talked about before this, it was a mass spectrometry-based assay. So very different analytical uh, evaluations might need to be done uh, based on that, that um, methodology. So isobaric compounds, extraction efficiencies, et cetera. So, um, again, the analytic evaluation will be different, uh, will have different parameters based on the assay platform. In this case, for proenkephalin, we're talking about immunoassay platform, does not uh, use biotin, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, and so some examples of some of the analytic validation that was performed, I won't go into details um, about those because uh, Dr. Musen did a nice job in his presentation. But, uh, you know, we, we did perform, of course, within and uh, between run um, assay precision studies, again, using different concentrations of uh, patient pooled plasma um, at different concentrations within the analytical measuring range. We evaluated the accuracy. This can be done by either um, comparing to a reference method or, or um, you know, uh, spiking in known concentrations of um, purified compound into a um, assay matrix and making sure that you can recover that known concentration. So there's several different ways of, of performing accuracy studies. Um, analytical measuring range, uh, mixing you know, high and low samples together and making sure that uh, the recovery is, is linear uh, within that um, AMR. Your uh, limit of quantitation, so you want to make sure that, uh, def well, you want to define the lowest reportable value in your uh, concentration range that has that you can measure precisely. Uh, and then, of course, we, we evaluated our reference intervals. We defined um, uh, 120 uh, normal donors uh, and uh, um, uh, collected plasma from them um, and uh, calculated a central 95th percentile in that healthy no normal donor uh, cohort. Um, evaluated analytical specificity, in this case, uh, looking for potential interference uh, from uh, hemolysis or hypertriglyceridemia or even um, elevated bilirubin, um, things like that. Some example data that what we can show, um, all of this data is actually in um, uh, under submission uh, at a, from in a manuscript. Uh, but some data that I will show you here is precision at low, mid, and high concentrations within the proenkephalin um, analytical measuring range and, range, and all CVs were less than 5%. Linearity studies are shown in the bottom uh, with linearity ranges um, uh, shown to be uh, from high to low concentrations as shown here. And then uh, reference interval data shown from our healthy reference population. Again, patients with, uh, that are deemed by us to be uh, healthy um, and wouldn't have abnormal proenkephalin concentrations um, with no renal dysfunction. And, um, and so you can see that there's no, uh, in this cohort, no age or uh, gender difference. And lastly, um, we, after performing the analytical validation, um, then we went to, after being, being um, uh, satisfied with the, with the performance of the analytic validation, then we went on to evaluate this marker clinically. So in our patient cohort, what we did was we identified um, over 1,100 patients with varying renal functions and comorbidities. And you can see the breakdown of the individuals here, um, they range from patients uh, who were being evaluated as a potential kidney donor. So these would be individuals who would obviously have sufficient renal function if they're, uh, if they're being evaluated as a potential kidney donor, all the way down to folks who have a very severe chronic kidney disease. Um, and those folks would obviously have a, a, a compromised renal function. And all patients in, in this cohort had measured GFR um, by isothalamate clearance. And what then we did was we measured proenkephalin in all of these patients who were seen for various reasons but had measured GFR concentrations. And we um, measured 
proencephalin and compared to their uh, measured GFR. And so what we saw in our study is um, identical, very similar to what has been published, is that proencephalin negatively associated with GFR in our patient population. And that we um, could potentially use proencephalin um, in a model to estimate GFR in these patients. Um, and um, ongoing studies will, will, are ongoing and w will be needed to determine um, if an equation can be used using PNK um, for estimation of GFR. So that's the first biomarker um, uh, that I wanted to talk about. And then the second one I'll go over a little bit more quickly is neurotensin. Neurotensin is a 13 amino acid peptide hormone. It's produced in the small intestine after intake of saturated fat, uh, and it stimulates pancreatic secretion and colonic motility. And it actually suppresses feelings of hunger. The problem, and this may sound familiar from the previous biomarker, is that neurotensin, the peptide, is very unstable with a half-life of around two minutes. Obviously not very conducive to measuring in the laboratory since uh, it, the, it will be essentially gone by the time it gets to the laboratory for, for measurement. So very similar to the, to the uh, story that I told you before for proencephalin, for, pro, for neurotensin, um, uh, the assay has been de an assay has been developed for measuring again a stable peptide from proneurotensin, the parent protein that makes the active peptide neurotensin. But um, again, an amino assay has been developed for a stable peptide called uh, from the proneurotensin um, that is much more amenable for for measurement in the laboratory, and is made obviously produced in equal molar concentration to the active neurotensin peptide. It turns out that proneurotensin and the neurotensin 1 receptor are expressed highly in breast cancer tissues. Um, and you can see Western blots shown on this slide. And in two studies, the Malmo Diet and Cancer Study, as well as the Malmo Prevention Project, it turns out that patients with um, High, the highest concentrations of proneurotensin in circulation and in plasma are at the highest risk of incident breast cancer. And it's important that, um, that you realize this is incident breast cancer and not recurrence, um, which really is, um, it is great to have a new biomarker in this area for um, potentially identifying patients for incidence of breast cancer. So for this reason, uh, we in the laboratory, as well as our clinical colleagues, uh, found this to be a promising biomarker, and we're not as far along with evaluating this one, but we're, we're well on our way. So we've actually already completed our analytical validation, very similar uh, steps that, uh, that I outlined for the, um, for the studies that we performed with proencephalin, so I won't go through them again here, but uh, because the assay platform is very similar, it's another ELISA-based uh, assay. Uh, very similar analytic valid evaluation that we did, and all uh, parameters performed uh, really very nicely throughout uh, the clinically relevant measuring range. And so um, the next steps that we have ongoing are uh, that we're, evaluate, we're, we're forming a clinical evaluation study, um, partnering the laboratory with our clinical colleagues and collecting patient samples to be able to um, um, evaluate this biomarker in our own patient population here at Mayo Clinic. And through the uh, collaboration with Swingotech, uh, we've actually formed a formal collaborative research um, partnership such that uh, we at Mayo Clinic will be uh, performing these research studies with Mayo Clinic patient samples. Um, but then we've also opened this project up to be a testing site for um, outside researchers who have interest in the biomarkers that are produced by Smingotech, uh, the two biomarkers that I presented here, both proencephalin and proneurotensin, as well as other biomarkers under development at Sphingotech, um, such that we would be a testing site for outs uh, researchers outside of Mayo Clinic who actually might want to do some research on these bi using these biomarkers in their own patient samples, but don't have the means to bring up the assay themselves. 
and this is a unique partnership between Syngotech and Mayo Clinic that offers us a unique uh, research perspective um, here at Mayo Clinic to further patient um, care, further research, and hopefully um, improve the health of, of our patients and those um, um, everywhere around the world. So in conclusion today, I hope what we have done is given you a sense of what it might take to transition a biomark from the basic research setting, again, a setting where um, uh, either basic researchers or companies in, in either the academic field or um, in the uh, uh, you know, more private, field, private area have actually done the research to develop these assays, um, identifying the biomarkers of interest and develop, even develop assays but haven't transitioned it to clinical use. So I'm hope, I hope we've given you a sense of the efforts that it takes in a clinical laboratory to take that research um, and do the, both the analytical and the clinical evaluations in a hospital setting to then uh, um, be, be confident in the assay performance, both analytically that you're getting the right number and clinically that, um, that the number that you get will be uh, useful for patient care. It certainly is a lot of work, is time consuming, but hopefully with a lot of gain um, for, the, for patient care at the end. So with that, we would certainly like to end um, um, and take any, any questions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jaffe, Dr. Newsom, and Dr. Donato for your presentations. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. The speakers will answer as many questions as time permits. So let's see, our first question of the day, doctors, asks, how do you learn about new biomarkers and partner with basic researchers or companies that have discovered them? So thank you for the question. Um, we, we're at a large academic medical center, and so um, uh, having we ha do certainly have the resources, both, both personnel and, um, and equipment, to uh, have the means to evaluate these biomarkers. And then specifically about how to make the connections, um, I think it's really important to network um, at uh, national, national and international meetings where both um, uh, representatives from academia as well as, as, um, as uh, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies are there um, to start conversations about what's, what's new, what's out there, uh, what's on the horizon, and um, how can we be a part of evaluating the next generation of biomarkers uh, to advance patient care. Excellent, thank you so much for your uh, response. Our second question asks, how do you know what specific validation studies need to be performed? Sounds fairly straightforward in that uh, there is a whole list of accreditation agencies that have already made the rules for us. <laughs> Obviously, we wanna make sure that we do uh, an excellent job and we follow due diligence so that we're providing results that can be trustworthy and useful uh, in patient care. But uh, as far as what specific experiments are required, the College of American Pathologists, as well as the New York State Department of Health and CMS all have lists that are readily available. And we also involve a plan and evolve a plan right from the beginning that includes not only an analytic validation, but the ability to know that in some way, whether it is because of a sample bank that is available or because we plan to do a prospective study that we will be able to do at least a modest clinical evaluation to make sure that the results in Mayo Clinic patients and in the areas that we serve will have similar results to what we've seen in the literature. Okay, thank you for your response. Our third question asks, how does your lab determine which tests to work on? There are a variety of considerations. One includes what sorts of gaps we see and what needs we see for clinical testing. 
We are always attracted to those areas which will help the most patients, as is the mantra of the Mayo Clinic. But a second important consideration is the ability to implement that sort of testing, both analytically and clinically. We have fairly extensive and sophisticated resources, but we can't do everything, and we therefore have to pick and choose those areas where we have tremendous expertise. So it makes no sense for us to emerge, to use a technology that we're not familiar with. Instead, we focus on those areas where we can make the technology fit. And finally, given we want to do both an analytic and a clinical validation, we have to have the idea that in the long run we will be able to look and validate that what we're doing is clinically useful. Because a simple analytic validation, even though it takes a lot of work, is not adequate for us to advocate to the world that this is something that may be helpful to patients. All right, thank you. Our next question, let's see, this one asks, how long does the development and validation process take? Yeah, this, it's, uh, well, it's highly variable from test to test, um, but it, it, it is quite lengthy in, in all honesty. Um, the validation, the analytical validation that we've, we've outlined in, in the several tests that we've talked about today, again, they're fairly straightforward um, assays or, or experiments, um, and we run through them as fast as we can. So actually, that's probably the fastest part to, to get through the analytical validation part. Um, we're actually quite, quite, have quite a, a, a smooth running machine there for that, and our laboratory technologists are very, very um, equipped at doing that. Uh, I would say the longest part can be the clinical validation part. And this has a lot to do with what Dr. Jaffe was talking about earlier in the previous question, because um, you really do have to identify patients who you can collect samples, either residual samples or prospectively collect them, um, to uh, validate the assay um, in, in some sort of clinical cohort. Um, and so this can take quite a bit of time, especially if it's a prospective collection uh, with IRB um, approval needed uh, and, infor and uh, informed consent. Um, uh, if, it's a, if it's a previous cohort that we have, a, a, a previous study bank already collected a frozen cohort, uh, that, that is much easier and can speed up the timeline quite a bit because essentially all you would need to do is, is an IRB um, modification to add that particular study. Um, if the patients have already given informed consent for future studies using that sample, and then you're off to the races and can just test in the assay. So, um, so really it is variable. It's hard to give a timeline. Um, certainly six months would be very, uh, I, would be ideal. It can be even longer. Um, and then, of course, uh, even outside of the laboratory, uh, then we get into the um, uh, test build process, which as probably most Clinician, laboratory, laboratorians out there know that um, uh, that IT resources are are uh, challenging to then just just the activities of building the test. So that it t it can take quite a while. If I can put on my administrative hat and remind my colleagues that we um, have a fairly robust infrastructure that we fund based on the education, research, and development funds of the institution that give us additional personnel so that we're not competing with the production aspect of the laboratory. Yes. Excellent, point. excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, we got a couple more questions coming in. Uh, the next question asks, what is the difference between tests which are available for research use and those that are clinically available? That one. <clears throat> Analytically speaking, if this test is something that we are offering for research use and uh, commercially, uh, you know, telling people it's available, I will say analytically there is no difference. That means that if it's gotten to that stage, we've vetted the precision, the accuracy. We believe the number that we report is the truth. 
However, the reason we would perhaps hesitate in making this available clinically is there's either not enough data or, or even conflicting data in the literature, et cetera, about the utility or what this might mean for patient care interactions. So that would be the only reason we would hold off on making something ready uh, clinically. All right, thank you. And it appears we only have time for one more question today. Um, how does your lab determine when a test is ready for clinical use? Well, again, it has to be analytically robust and meet the highest standards and that laboratory uh, procedures mandate. It has to be capable of going through the approval process, whether it is FDA, New York State, CLIA, CAP, or anything else. And it has to have at least a moder modicum of a robust clinical validation that says it will help patients. I would like to once again thank Dr. Jaffe, Dr. Musen, and Dr. Donato for their presentations. Uh, doctors, do you have any final comments? We've enjoyed having all of you with us. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. We would also like to thank our speakers from the Mayo Clinic and our sponsor, Signotech, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through July of 2018. LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye from LabRoot.